Okay, welcome everybody. Here is our uh, next session. We're going to be talking about the uh, new protocol, the new set of specifications that uh, Ames and the VSF are working on um, in close cooperation called IPMX, which is a intended to be a new open source specification for uh, use in primarily uh, pro, -A video pro AV applications. So without further ado, we have Andrew Starks from Magnica, and he's going to walk us through it. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your patience, and uh, it's good to see everybody here. Uh, thanks for that introduction, Wes. Now I don't have to tell you who I am, because you already did. Um, so we are going to talk about IPMX today, but I also wanted to throw in a little twist at the end. We're going we're gonna to relate it to live production, because um, as Wes said, um, IPMX stands for IP Media Experiences. What it really is is, is an open standard that's designed specifically for the pro AV market, but it's built on SMPTE 2110 and NMOS, and we'll go into that with a little bit of detail here. But first I want to define what pro AV means, because <laughs> this has been a real vexing problem. Um, we talked about it for quite a while in, in, in a JTNM group and came to uh, this definition, which essentially says that it's audiovisual anywhere where we're not in the media and entertainment industry. So if your primary business is not um, uh, putting out content, if your primary business is healthcare or education or you know that sort of thing, uh, then you're in pro AV, no matter what you're doing with the video. And to illustrate that, I want to use my favorite example, um, looking at a sports stadium. You have broadcast, you know, in this traditional sense of broadcast happening there, but you also have the video production that's happening for the internal signage, like the, the jumbo display. All that is a production. All that's done with video and audio. Um, you've got conference rooms. All those have AV. You've got, you know, every form of digital signage you can think of, cameras, medical equipment. They use you know, every in incarnation of AV that you can think of, oops, and uh, we're, um, it, slide wanted me to continue to move on, uh, but, but all that's happening in a stadium, and very increasingly, that content is moving between systems and being used um, in different ways for, uh, in different contexts. So today, in the pro-AV world, we have SMPTE 2110 in the broadcast world, but beyond that, what's really kind of gained traction and what's out there in the marketplace are, you know, they're blessed with more than a dozen different options. Um, some of them, you know, excellent quality, low latency, everything that you'd ask for in a system. Uh, some of them have, you know, strengths and weaknesses, um, but, but the truth is, is none of them are compatible. None of them have compatible discovery, registration. None of them have compatible streams that can take each other's content. Now, we do have some single chip proprietary systems that are on this end where you get interoperability between vendors, but um, again, they don't talk to each other. And so the market in Pro AV, there's a lot of demand for it. There's a lot of advantages to IP video, um, but I think everybody would agree that customers are very frustrated in that it's not as big a market as, as it could be. Um, and that's where you know open standards come in. In about 2018 or so, I wasn't actually there, but we started to kind of, as a first step, bring SMPTE 2110 and NMOS into the Pro-AV market. So we started going to Infocom trade shows and, and, and talking about the benefits of open standards. And you know, people were interested, and there is adoption in, in the Pro-AV world for SMPTE 2110, but there were just too many gaps. So taking that information and um, kind of thinking it through a little bit more. We came up with a roadmap. We came up with a, a, a branding. One of the things that we definitely needed was a quicker way to say SMPTE 2110 plus NMOS plus the things that Pro AV needs. So we came up with IPMX and launched that at ISC uh, 2020. As far as the apps go, there's some overlap and some that don't overlap are unique to the Pro AV world. Just speaking very broadly, obviously we believe they needed a real standard. They also have the same needs that broadcast has. They're doing things in the cloud. They want a protocol and they, they want a, a workflow that works in the cloud and on-premise together as one system. 
Um, they, they do a lot of presentations, which is what we think of when we think of Pro AV, but they also do a lot of production. So it's simply not the case anymore that um, Pro AV does not mean live production. There's plenty of live production happening in Pro AV. Think of a classroom. A lot of those are automated live production systems where they're recording the classroom and the PowerPoint. There's nobody back there doing the live production, but there's some, you know, machine algorithm that's sensing when movement's happening, so it does switching and it knows when somebody in the classroom asks a question, so it switches to the classroom and it does that stuff all automatically. That's live production and that's in Pro AV. Um, these two kind of go together. We need something that's both economical for today, but yet can handle things like 8K. There's a lot more 8K happening in Pro AV than in broadcast. And, um, and so they need, you know, a lot of times they need uncompressed. A lot of times they need super low latency and synchronized sources. Pro AV needs a lot of the things broadcast needs every now and again, um, but they also need that kind of plug and play. Not always a professional user is going to be in the room trying to implement, you know, this stuff. And they need to be able to plug it in in my laptop. I don't know video modes, but lo and behold, there it appears. You know, they need that kind of plug and play experience. There's an awful lot of one gig out there. They want to see systems that 4K 60 desktop on a on a on a one gig connection. That's that's kind of like the price of entry in Pro AV. You have to have that, a good story for that. Um, so we, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go through in detail every one of these things, but we started with SEMTI 2110 using NMOS for um, discovery and registration, um, you know, and, and, you know, having that ability to go from SD to 32K, you know, uh, multi, multi bandwidth, that's not very common in the proprietary systems. Generally, those systems are a one gig system or a 10 gig system, but there aren't any that are flexible like IPMX and SEMTI 2110 are. Um, but also we have to add EDID, and so EDID is that thing, in, it's a binary file inside your monitor that tells the source what it can do, and then the source decides, based on that information, what to put on the monitor. Something that you want to keep away from your live production system, but incredibly important in Pro AV, and I would say also in live production, you know, multi-viewers dealing with things like that, having good EDID support helps everybody. Um, as I mentioned earlier, compressed and uncompressed. Compressed for that one gig application, but then you have a lot of uncompressed scenarios as well. Security is as important as it is in podcast, so we just bring those things along with us. And, um, but, but also, um, uh, time. So in, in SEMTI 2110, PTP, a very strict level of PTP is required. In the Pro AV world, a lot of times PTP is not required. You know, think about a laptop going to just one display. You can just lock to the media clock of the laptop. HDMI doesn't care about what your PTP does anyway. You can't lock that. So um, a, lot, a lot of scenarios where PTP might not be required. So IPMX defines, um, defines those. Um, and I'll cover some of these others here in the next slide. So I'll skip over those. Um, I'm not going to talk about this too much other than to point at it and mention that it's also duplicated on that wall over there. But this is the, the JTNM Pro AV roadmap, which is what IPMX follows. And you can see this line here is brought to you mostly by the work that's already being done for broadcast. Uh, but then these are a lot of the items that we need for Pro AV, including HDCP support uh, for content protection, EDID, as I mentioned before, those kinds of things are nearing completion now. We're, we're now to the point where we're starting to see IPMX ready product. We're um, planning an interop event in, um, uh, uh, in Vegas here at Infocom later this year, and I'll point to that a little bit later. And in phase two, we have a lot of the things that you need when you have a product as a standard, or a standard as a product, I should say, um, including training, you know, that kind of stuff, having the training materials ready, but also having a story for WAN. And so in phase two, we had, you know, looking at higher, higher efficiency codecs and looking at um, technology like RIST for um, dealing with error loss and things like that. Um, so feel free to ask me questions about the roadmap later. Um, but leaving off here, so we introduced IPMX in 2020, and then we started to um, put together the roadmap and uh, really work with AMWA and, and uh, VSF to, you know, make the specifications and standards that we needed. Um, we started to do our promotion. We signed on our very first Pro AV member in Magewell in 2020, and we continued to, you know, do promotions during COVID period, and we signed on. 
um, Analog Way, Panduit, and also recently Barco. And then also in the VSF, um, Netgear, Intel, and Xilinx, you know, probably not all for IPMX, but I do know there was a, a lot of IPMX interest there. Um, and so participation has been really building up. And as I mentioned, at, at June in Infocom, if you are going to that show, um, we'll be showing an interoperability, multi-vendor interoperability demonstration or early, early IPMX products. So that's my whirlwind tour of IPMX and what it's about. So what are the differences and what about live production? And I kind of split this off into two different slides. These are the things that lower cost. One of the things IPMX needed to do was it needed to be a simpler thing to work with while having the ability to interoperate with systems that are designed for broadcast. So that means, uncom that means uncompressed is something that is optional in IPMX and it's pretty typical in SMPTE 2110. In, um, in IPMX, you see when you JPEG access as a baseline codec, I would say you know, our anticipation is that compressed systems are more typical than uncompressed systems. So optional for uncompressed in, in both, but, but typical for a 70 20 time. For PTP required, you know, 2059, one and two, right? We start there. And that's, of course, would be if you had a system that was, um, you know, compliant with this, it would work very well. It would work great for IPMX system. But we back off the um, uh, the request request interval minimums. I forget what it is. Oh, shoot. He told me what it was. We, we back off a setting that's very chatty on networks and requires you to have transparent switches and everything else. So we basically allow, we, we say that an IPMX compliant receiver has to have an amount of buffering to, to handle um, um, a little bit more slop in, in PTP timing. So basically, if you're used to AES 67's timing, it's going to be very similar to IPMX. Um, we also add RCP, RTCP sender reports because by design, um, IPMX is designed to treat asynchronous sources as first-class citizens. So with the NMOS APIs and with the way um, IPMX is designed, you'll be able to derive what the precise time of the clock is that you're getting so you can achieve lock with uh, asynchronous sources. And you'll know the relative time to maybe your synchronous sources if you're blending things together, like you're doing a live production and some of your inputs are HDMI. Um, you'll be able to sort of reason about what the timing is there. So we, PTP timing is not very typical in Pro AV. They don't, they don't typically deal with um, synchronized sources and things like that. It's much more presentation oriented. So we see PTP as a huge benefit for IPMX because it allows us to meet those use cases and make it simple for people that you know, are, are only dealing with asynchronous sources, don't do any seamless switching at all, so they don't care to, to deal with that kind of, those issues, um, versus the ones that really do care about that because they're doing live production and they need very low latencies because, you know, they're doing like iMags so where, they're, where they're shooting the presenter and then they have them blown up on the screen behind them and the amount of latency that you can really tolerate there is very, very low. IPMX would be a, a great solution for that kind of scenario. Um, also, oh, the last one is wide sender. So if you look at these requirements here, everything pretty much from here on down is kind of summarized as supporting software. That's another real, um, you know, consequence of having, you know, claiming you support like a cloud arch architecture or you're, or you're trying to make things less expensive. There's going to be a lot of times when, especially in live production, when you're doing things virtually, where uh, the ability to have efficient software implementations are important, and that's that's really speaks to everything here. Um, in SMPTE 2110, you know, wide sender support is optional. Where where for uh, IPMX, it's you have to you have to support it. So, and the uh, these are kind of more tweaks and additions. You'll notice, you know, we say in the in the SMPTE 2110 world, you you kind of assume it, the YUV422 is going to be the norm, right? Um, in uh, IPMX, that's required. You have to support that, and you also have to support RGB 444. And if anybody sees any errors on here, raise your hand and tell me I've got an error on here. Because okay, what is the the error? What's it? Oh no, that's terrible. Oh man. Well, you haven't heard of 76? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. What's that? No, I, yeah, well, I didn't know there was, I didn't know, you knew. Oh, you spotted it. That was a funny joke, actually. No. All right, so if you spot any other errors, let me know later. <laughs> um, but but in, in IPMX, we require support for uh, 444 because people are going to expect that. And that's also, frankly, what 
um, is the minimum for HDMI. HDMI, you have to be able to support 640 by 480 video, RGB 444, it's the minimum. Um, also for audio, so we use AES67, and I very much typo, very embarrassing. Um, in um, SMPTE 2110, I don't that the that you have or the frequency. In IPMX, um, 48 kilohertz audio is required, and 44.1 is defined um, and required. Or um, and uh, it's a it's a <laughs> um, as well as 96 kilohertz audio as well. Um, IS or um, ISO 4 and 5, I forget the TR document that actually spells out that NMOS is part of a proper system. In IPMX, we take that same approach. We're saying, um, you know, NMOS is required. You cannot say your device is, is IPMX compliant if it doesn't have NMOS in it. Um, we do add I, um, IS 11, which is the EDID and dynamic connection. It's, it handles EDID, but not only that, but what happens when the monitor goes to sleep or the source goes away, but you still want the connection to come back when it you know, comes alive again. IS 11 is about all of those kinds of scenarios, that behavior you expect to have from an HDMI cable. Um, being able to represent that in an, an IP system takes a lot, of, a lot of work, and we're getting, we're doing really well with that. And then finally, I mentioned before, HCCP. So in live production, you don't want to see that anywhere near <laughs> your equipment, but in Pro-AV, you have to respect and support it. Um, so with all that, um, where does that kind of leave us? You know, support for asynchronous and synchronous sources. You, you can say that um, IPMX adds the option for no PTP and it adds really robust support for asynchronous sources. But another way to look at it is, is that, because you know, when you look at the rest of the world, they kind of toss timing out the window and they just say, well, you know, you have video and you can retime it how, however you need to. Um, but with IPMX, we have that SMPTE 2110 background and we have that support for PTP in there, which is really good. Um, I think you know, EDID is probably um, not so much important for live production, but there are some scenarios where you need to deal with it and having the ability to see what your monitor can support in a reliable way, those APIs will be really helpful for that. KVM you know, support is probably not front and center for live production, but sometimes controllers getting, um, are part of that, so having a universal way to connect a mouse and keyboard remotely in live productions. I don't know if your guys' live productions go well like mine do, but sometimes when something unexpected happens, that can be helpful. Um, and then also JPEG XS, obviously, um, broadcast is starting to take that on as a codec, and uh, IPMX choice for that makes interoperability a lot, a lot easier. And, um, and finally, you know, I think that interoperability with SMPTE 2110 and really having a strong focus on, on, on systems that were compatible with software implementations are kind of the two core things that um, have been really relevant and really resonating in the Pro-AV world, that, that open standards message as well as supporting software implementations and making things more flexible. So with that, that's my presentation, and I appreciate you guys' kind attention. Thank you, Andy.